Okay, you guys ready? All right, well, welcome everybody here to the second session of our 19 box. I'm Professor Frank Cole, I'm the director of the Central Program. And what you're about to witness from Team Green here is the culmination of three and a half years of really hard work. Um, they've learned a lot, they've gained a lot of experiences, they've, uh, I think, dedicated blood, sweat, and tears, all, all, all that to this project. Um, and I think they're going to learn, learn a, a lot of what they have to tell you today. The way it's going to work is we're going to present to you for about 25 minutes. And then we have a panel of discussion. Here are the scholars in the field related to the research. And they will be, uh, we'll be asked about 10 minutes worth of questions when the students are finished presenting. And then we'll open up questions to the general audience for about 10 minutes. That's any questions you want of these students. And then the students and the discussants and their mentor who's running late will be here in a couple of minutes. So we can introduce them to stall on a little bit. Um, <laughs> They will adjourn into a back room that has no windows, that's spiderware, that's just real gross, so they're going to spend an hour asking very detailed questions about the thesis that these students wrote. And that's an experience that is a wonderful experience that most undergraduates don't get to have. And I think they'll learn about my experience. So, King Green, are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon. We are Team Dream and welcome to our thesis defense on neurogeneration research exploring animal models of Alzheimer's disease. Our aim is to characterize RTG 4510 mice models on neurogenesis and cognitive function. Neurogenerative diseases are a group of conditions that cause the significant degeneration of neurons. Neurons are specialized cells that transmit information through electrochemical processes in the brain. The degeneration of neurons leads to loss of structure and function of the neurons, which is called cognitive decline, known as dementia. Dementia is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and takes up an amount of $200 million in healthcare costs. Half of these costs being counted to Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive, incurable disease that causes the death of neurons through and destruction of the loss of episodic and functional memory and also cognition. An accumulation of beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles found in the brain triggers the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. This may signify that the need to comprehend neurogenesis and cognitive function may, may play a role in preventative and treatment measures of Alzheimer's disease. There are many symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. One of the early symptoms is the loss of sense and smell, which is olfaction. The olfactory bulb is a neuronal structure in the brain that is responsible for the sense of smell. It is located in the limbic system and the forebrain. The presence of amyloid beta proteins, neurofibrillary tangles, and pathology in the olfactory bulb may play a role in this loss of this specific sense. The figure behind me represents the olfactory bulb, its supporting structures, and the activity in the brain. As you can see on the left, this is the profile position of the face. As an odor molecule enters through, enters through the nose, through the nasal cavity, there is the olfactory epithelium. This is a specialized epithelial tissue located in the roof of the nasal cavity. There are olfactory sensory neurons located in the olfactory epithelium that branch over the cribriform plate, which is a plate of ethmoid bone that separates the olfactory bulb and the brain from the nasal cavity. This branches over the cribriform plate into the olfactory bulb and sends odor processing signals throughout the brain. Now, to go into specifics of odor processing, the odor will enter the nose through the nasal cavity attached to receptors located in the olfactory nerve layer. This causes the neurons to fire an action potential through the olfactory ner nerve layer to the olfactory bulb, which sends signals throughout the olfactory system. Now to, now, to now to go further into the specifics of the synaptic processing, this is a figure of the neuronal circuit of the olfactory bulb. Starting from the top, this is the olfactory sensory neurons located in the olfactory epithelium. So as the lower molecule binds the receptors, it will, it will fire an action potential through the axon to the glomerulus in the brain. The glomerulus is a tangle of neurons that is responsible for the transfer system that turns nasal information into brain information. In the glomerulus, there's mitocells. So the sensory neuron axons will terminate and synapse with the mitocells, and this will send signals throughout the brain through the layers of the olfactory bulb to the olfactory cortex and the cerebral cortex of the brain. A process that is unique to many regions of the brain, such as the olfactory, olfactory bulb, is the adult neurogenesis. 
This is a dynamic process that involves the birth of new neurons through proliferation, migration, and differentiation. The new neurons will be derived from a dividing cell population of stem cells and progenitor cells. The young neurons will migrate from the subventricular zone to the olfactory bulb and form granular cells and paraglomular cells. This process, autoergosis has been shown to be regulated by olfactory stimuli, which may indicate that it can be regulated by olfactory behavioral experience in animal models, such as mice. The figure behind me depicts the brain of a mouse and the process of adult neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb. As the neurons transfer through the subventricular zone, they migrate through the rostral migratory stream and to the olfactory bulb where they differentiate into granular cells and periglomular cells, which are responsible for monitoring mitral cells whose function is to go through odor processing and receive input from the olfactory sensory nerves. The final form of neurons will be granular cells. Laura will now delve deeper into the pathological hallmarks of, the, of Alzheimer's disease and how this impacts the neuronal, fun neuronal functions and structures. So one of the main pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease is amyloid beta plaque. And amyloid beta is a protein that is formed from a larger protein, APP, and when APP is cleaved by a specific sequence of enzymes, this leads to a harmful form of amyloid beta, which can accumulate in the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and aggregate to each other to form a sort of toxic plaque, which um, is known to attribute to the cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. The pathway by which amyloid beta leads to this cognitive of decline is not yet entirely determined. One hypothesis is that it interferes at synapses, which is where neurons communicate information between each other, um, or that it activates some sort of cascade that acts independently once it's initially activated by toxic amyloid beta. The main pathological hallmark that we will be focusing on is tau. And tau normally functions in stabilizing microtubules, which are responsible for transporting cargo across the cell. So tau will normally bind to these microtubules and allow the cargo to be transported efficiently. It's known to be concentrated at the distal end of neurons, which could be due to the fact that that's close to the synaptic cleft, which is where neurotransmitters will be transported from cell to cell. However, in Alzheimer's disease, this tau can become hyperphosphorylated, which means that it can no longer bind correctly to the microtubule. And this is believed to be a cause of um, cognitive decline that's caused specifically by tau. It's also believed that tau can, this hyperphosphorylated form of tau can accumulate due to amyloid beta formation, but this is not yet well understood either. What's being shown here in this image is the aggregated harmful form of amyloid beta plaque and the disintegrating microtubules due to tau not being able to bind to them correctly. More closely here in this image, tau is binding correctly to the microtubule, which is how it would be in a healthy neuron. However, when tau is hyperphosphorylated, it dissociates from the microtubule and binds to each other, leading to the formation of neurofibrillary tangles, or NFTs, in the diseased neuron. So for our experiment, we would chose, we chose to use a mouse model that displayed pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Specifically, the model that we chose was the RTG4510 model, which we will hereby refer to as the TG or transgenic mouse model. This mouse model has a transgene inserted into it that causes it to produce more tau in general and hyperphosphorylated, the harmful hyperphosphorylated form of tau. We also chose this mouse model specifically because it does it has been shown to have early onset tau pathology, which is important because we did have limited time to conduct our experiments, and thus it's important that we choose a model that's feasible for us to use. Also, the effects of this model are reversible in that if we apply a specific drug to this mouse, it can deactivate the transgene, which is useful in research. Additionally, this mouse model allows us to isolate the effects of tau pathology away from just how tau functions in relation to amyloid beta pathology. More specifically here, what's being shown is the timeline of the TG mouse model and information collected from previous studies about this mouse model. Some key things to point out are that there has been hippocampal cognitive decline shown at about three months as measured through spatial tests such as the Morris water maze. 
There have also been tangles shown to be present between 2.5 and 4 months in this mouse model, specifically in the hippocampus, and loss in brain weight at about 5 months, which is indicative of the loss of neurons in the hippocampus. However, all of these findings are um, specific to the hippocampus, and the olfactory bulb in this mouse model has not yet been explored. For our experimental approach, because we know that olfaction is a factor in Alzheimer's disease and that this mouse model is representative in, of Alzheimer's disease through its tau pathology, we wanted to determine exactly how this olfactory disruption occurs in the transgenic model. Specifically, we plan to do this through looking at aspects of behavioral tests that look specifically at olfaction and through neurogenesis, which we can use to, which is a process, and we can use that to count the amount of new cells, new neurons specifically in the olfactory bulb in this mouse model. And we want to observe these characteristics across various ages of the mouse model in order to better determine at what point this pathology is most affecting the model. Ultimately, our main research questions were if there are olfactory changes that occur in AD as displayed through the TG mouse model that is representative of Alzheimer's disease. Also, we wanted to see what are these changes that occur and if they can be observed both through neurogenesis and through looking at the behavioral test. And we wanted to try to specify as much as possible when do these deficits occur. Our hypotheses were that the transgenic mouse model would show age-dependent cognitive decline in olfactory function as measured through the results of the behavioral tests and through counts in neurogenesis. We also expect that there will be a decline in function in the wild-type mice that's age-dependent simply due to the fact that they're aging, but that this decline will not be as severe as that that is displayed by the transgenic model. We also expect that there will be consistencies between um, the results that we observed through the olfactory behavioral test and through looking at neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb. Now we'll pass this on to Alice to give an overview of our behavioral experiments. As previously discussed, we use wild-type mice as a control for our transgenic mouse model. Young mice range from one to three months of age because that's when they're still healthy behaviorally and symptoms haven't begun to manifest yet. We use seven-month-olds for older mice because that's when they're confirmed to have neuronal loss. In phase one of our experiments, we use three common behavioral tests used to characterize mouse models. With these tests, we could also compare age-dependent differences in cognitive decline. The first two were these olfactory-based tests, habituation, dishabituation, or hab-dishab aims to confirm the mouse's ability to discriminate between different odors. And once we know that the mouse can do that, we would move on to the next test. Odor detection threshold, or ODT, tries to find the lowest concentration of an odor that a mouse can still identify. And our last test was actually not olfactory based and served as a more general control behavioral test. Novel object recognition or NOR is actually more hippocampus based. So our first test was hab dis hab and in the protocol the mouse would be acclimated to the cage environment for 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, we would place a cube with our primary odor, l carvone on it um, with the mouse and see how long the mouse investigated that cube for trials number one through six. And on trial seven, we replaced that odor with d carvone the novel odor which is closely related to the primary odor, and we would say how long the mouse investigated that odor for. And we would expect that investigation time would decrease as trial six gets closer and increase upon trial seven because the mouse is getting used to the, the odor that it's already experienced or habituation and it is not used to the novel odor, so that would be dishabituation. And that would just mean that the mouse has the ability to differentiate between similar odors and has a functioning olfactory system. So we expected that transgenic and older mice would display defective habituation because transgenic mice would start to manifest the symptoms of neurodegeneration while older mice would just start to be aging. And here are our results show that younger mice generally had higher investigation time differences. Um, but we actually use both two-month-old mice and three-month-old mice for young mice, so the two-month-olds on the left um, might not have finished developing yet. 
And on the right, we use seven-month-olds for um, our old group. So our second test, odor detection threshold, aims to identify the lowest concentration of an odor that a mouse can still identify. And as with have just had, each mouse is acclimated to the cage environment for 30 minutes, and then we would place a cube with water um, in the cage with the mouse for um, trials one to six, and we would see how long the mouse investigated that cube for. And then on trial seven, we would replace um, the water cube with the odor cube, which would be alcarvone. And each day, we would use a different serial dilution of alcarvone, and our serial dilutions range from 1 to 100K to 1 to 300K. So we compared the four different groups, and here we're showing transgenic mice. On the y-axis is the time difference between trials six and seven, because that's where we would expect the spike in difference. And on the x-axis is the concentration we use. So there's um, one to 300,000 all the way down to one, up to one, one to 100,000. And so the young transgenic mice here um, did have higher investigation time with serial dilutions used, and that would probably be because the young transgenic mice were not starting to show the effects of Alzheimer's disease yet. Additionally, we found that young wild-type mice had higher investigation time than older wild-type mice simply because young wild-type mice are not experiencing the effects of aging yet. And when we compare the young wild-type mice to the young transgenic mice, we did find that the young wild-type mice performed slightly better than the um, transgenic mice did, and that confirms that wild-type mice are healthy and performing as we would expect them to. So the third behavior test that we conducted was a non-olfactory um, behavior test called the novel object recognition. And this test served as a control since uh, previous studies have shown that there were hippocampal cognitive deficits shown in our um, TG mice models. And the behavioral test consisted of four periods. The first one was the acclimation period, which lasted for 10 minutes. And the mice were put into a empty cage and allowed time for um, it to investigate the cage and familiarize itself with it. The second period was the training period. And during this period, we put in two blue marbles for the um, trained objects and gave the mice 10 minutes for um, to investigate the, uh, the objects and familiarize itself with the object. The third period was the intermediate period and this lasted for approximately 45 minutes and the mice were put again back into the cage um, but this time empty with the um, objects taken out of the cage. And the last period was the testing period and during this period uh, we put in two different objects. The first one was the um, blue marble object, which was the trained object that the mice had time to um, investigate earlier in the training period. And then the second object was the novel object, which was a cube. And they were given five minutes to um, investigate both of the uh, different objects and um, the times were recorded. So our results showed that the young wild type and the transgenic mice and the old wild type Mice um, all showed a significant difference between the exploration time of the train and the novel objects, uh, which suggested that they were successfully able to distinguish the novel object in their environment. Hence, we concluded that these mice must not have an impaired um, functioning of the hippocampus. The old TG mice um, did not, however, show a uh, significant difference between the exploration time of the trained object and the novel object, and so we concluded that this group of mice must have cognitive impairment in the hippocampus and memory, memory storage functioning. And these results are consistent with other previous um, data collected by other um, uh, research studies um, done using other memory tasks. So moving on to phase two, uh, we analyzed ne adult neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb of the different treatment groups. Um, in order to do this, we injected the mice first with the BRDU, which was a dimine analog that gets integrated into the uh, DNA of the cell uh, during cellular division. And uh, we used this in order to label the uh, newly uh, born cells in the olfactory bulb. And these injections were done a month prior to the euthanization of the mice, since uh, previous studies have suggested that um, it takes about a month for the um, cell in the, to mature in the olfactory bulb. So after the injections, we perfused the mice 
um, with using cold piriform aldehyde and, um, and preserve the brains uh, for cryosep um, cryosectioning and immunohistochemical uh, staining. And then the prepared slides were um, analyzed under the confocal microscope uh, for a cell uh, quantification. And this here is the diagram that we showed you earlier of the brain of a mice, a mouse. And this was um, this is a close-up view of the olfactory bulb, and this looks exactly like how um, the, the slices that we prepared look like. And we counted cells in two different areas. Um, one was the accessory bulb, as you can see here in the red circle, and then the rest was the main accessory olfactory bulb. And this is a picture image taken from a confocal microscope, and the red cells here show the BRDU positive cells, which are the newly born cells, and then the green cells are the um, any UN positive cells, which are all of the neurons. And what we quantified were the um, co-localized cells, which were both red and green, because it meant that they were um, newly born neurons, which was indicative of neurogenesis. Okay. So although we hypothesized that both the wild type and the transgenic mice will show an age-dependent decline in the olfactory function as reflected in the neurogenesis, our data yielded surprising results. Um, after counting the newly born neurons from the confocal images that we collected, um, we were able to generate two graphs from the two areas of the olfactory bulb. Um, the graph shown here is in the accessory olfactory bulb, and you can see that there is um, an increase in neurogenesis in both the wild type and the transgenic mice um, that is dependent of age. And in the main olfactory bulb, there is an increase in neurogenesis in the wild type, similar to the ones in the accessory olfactory bulb. Um, this was surprising because um, previous studies have never seen an increase. Um, the studies that um, studied mainly the olfactory bulbs um, using different um, Alzheimer's transgenic models from ours. Um, however, there was a decrease in the main olfactory bulb, the ne in neurogenesis in the main olfactory bulb of the transgenic mice with age, which suggests that the tau transgene negatively affected neurogenesis. Although its explanations remain unclear, one plausible um, explanation for the increase in the neurogenesis of the wild-type mice could be that because um, we used the wild-type mice that were litter mates of the transgenic mice. Litter mates just means that the wild-type and the transgenic mice are from the same litter, and therefore the wild-type um, litter mates may have been affected by the transgene that characterizes the transgenic mice. So, in conclusion, our results were not sufficient enough, unfortunately, to answer our research questions of whether there are olfactory deficits in this mice model. Although um, the NORs confirmed um, that there was an age-dependent cognitive decline, um, our olfactory behavioral test yielded discrepancies from what we expected. Um, similarly, our neurogenesis analysis also showed um, discrepancies since there weren't any decrease in the wild time mice as we expected based on the previous study that I mentioned. Consequently, our results were not sufficient enough to determine whether this mice model is ideal for researching neuropathology in the olfactory bulb. So we spent a lot of time, a significant amount of time preparing for our experiments by researching and practicing methods that we had a very limited time to actually conduct our experiment, and therefore our experimental groups were not large enough, our sample size wasn't large enough to make definite conclusions. And therefore, in order to gain better analysis of the neurogenesis quantification in the olfactory bulb of this mice model, our immediate next steps would be to conduct more experiments using more mice. Um, and in addition, in order to gain more insight into whether the wild type litter mates were um, actually affected by the transgene, we can conduct more experiments using a different, well established wild type model, such as C55, as the control and to observe the changes. Um, furthermore, we can also conduct experiments using the mice at different ages to um, characterize the onset of cognitive deficits and neuronal loss in the olfactory bulb. This concludes our presentation. Um, we would like to thank Dr. Ricardo Aranita, our mentor, and his lab members, especially Krista Cray, the um, lab's research assistant who mentored us for a semester. We would like to thank Launch UMD donors, particularly Mr. Sean McDuffie from Stop Alzheimer's Now Foundation, who gave us a generous donation. We would also like to thank our gemstone directors, Dr. Kristen Scandal and Dr. Frank Cole, 
and the rest of the Gemstone staff for supporting us continuously and um, from, from the beginning. And we would like to lastly thank our discussants, um, Dr. Kara Duffy, Dr. Erica Glasper, Dr. David Yeager, Dr. Quentin Galdry, and Dr. Hadi Awoda. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
question process. <laughs> So from my understanding, because the tau functions in transporting cargo such as neurotransmitters um, th across the axon, um, and therefore this helps the relationship um, between many neurons and allows for cognitive processes to occur, if there's the toxic form of tau that's hyperphosphorylated and it can no longer function properly in the cell, this could lead those cells to become non-functional, um, and therefore that would kind of contribute to the loss of neurons because those are neurons that are no longer functioning. Um, that's what I would say. Okay, great answer. Let's move to another question from the discussion. I heard the class of the Department of Psychology. So the National Institutes of Health are really interested in understanding sex differences. And we always have to take into account um, the sex of our subjects as a biological variable. What, what were the sex or the gender of the mice that we used? And how might gender or sex, um, how might that play a role in their observed outcomes? Hi, so Dr. Glasper's question was whether there was a sex-dependent difference between the mice in our group and whether we use both sexes in our experimental groups. And the answer is that we did use um, both sexes in our groups and we tried to keep it evenly distributed because our mentor had told us that that was important and had us read studies on that. Um, and we actually did conduct experiments, spe specifically habituation, dishabituation experiments, um, testing differences between the two sexes and we found that male mice had very slightly higher investigation times but the results weren't significant so we just went along and used both sexes in our experimental groups. Okay, very good. Okay, so Dr. Duffy's question was, um, is the hyperphosphorylation of tau reversible? Um, so the answer is yes, I, I would say. <laughs> so when the, so when the, um, so, okay, so when the hyperphosphorylation happens, the tau gets um, accumulated and then uh, turns into the neurofibrillary tangles. Um, so in our mice, um, it was, the mutation was that if, we give them a treatment of doxycycline, which is a drug, it can actually reverse the effects of tau. Um, we actually did not look into this that um, efficiently or effectively, but um, that is what other research papers have said. So yes, it does. It is reversible. Okay, more discussion questions. and also faculty member in the biology department. Uh, two questions. One thing back on Dr. Duffy's question about the tau hyperphosphorylation. Um, are you aware of any of the chemicals that are involved in hyperphosphorylation of tau? Have you mentioned just one? Sorry. Are you aware of any of the chemicals that are involved in hyperphosphorylation of tau? Whether it's just one or many? I actually am not aware of that. Um, I would assume that there are several kinases that allow tau to be hyperphosphorylated, which would cause it to accumulate more quickly than if there was just one kinase, but honestly, I'm not specifically sure of that. Um, another question I have is about the BRD vaccine in the Somebody had mentioned that BRD was appropriate during cell division. I just wanted you to clarify what, what phase of the cell cycle you're saying that BRDU is normally appropriate? So the question was, uh, is the BRDU um, integrated into the cell during cell division? 
Um, actually, I might have just said that it's actually integrated into the DNA, and then it gets we can um, track it or label it, label the cell during cell division because it's in the DNA. And then, yeah, when it divides, we can label the cell. All right, very good. And now we're going to open the question up to anyone in the room who has any questions at all. And if your friends and family don't ask questions, we'll let the discussant ask more questions. Here we go. Hi. When you were doing the introducing the novelty item, why did you introduce the other person? Sorry, I think you Yeah, you put water in the tank before in between two cents. So the question was um, why we would use water on the cube um, in our experiments, right? Okay, so in odor, dis odor detection threshold, or ODT, we would put water, um, just water, 100 milliliters of it, on the cube for the first six trials, because um, water is sort of a neutral odor, right? So um, the mouse is just investigating that for six trials, and then on the seventh trial, it gets something that's distinctly different, um, L-carbone in its dilution for the day. So it, the mouse ideally would be able to detect Alcarbone is distinctly different from water. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question on your methods. Would you like to elaborate how you all um, dealt with the time of your investigation? Did you just do the stopwatch and kind of look to see like last entries? So the question was how we um, measure the investigation time of our um, behavioral test. Um, like you said, we did use a stopwatch. We just um, observed the mice moving and um, investigating the order or whatever it was. And we just um, timed how long they stayed, like sniffing it or something. Are they how we went about performing our experiment throughout the years and how we were organized into different meetings and different ways we did it. So we split our team up into three different groups about the behavioral testing and then we had also the um, neurogenesis testing and the odor detection threshold behaviors and also um, and so we split across three groups and then we also met about once a week and just kind of split the hours in between it takes to do each process between each other, um, about 10 hours a week in the lab, or every other week, depending on when we're doing the research and when we're just meeting to write the thesis. Did you ever add all those hours to the sum total of the amount of time you spent this project? <laughs> Maybe, so, like, 500? <laughs> <laughs> or about around there, you know, three years. A lot of time. <laughs> other questions? Okay. So you all said that about 2.5 from 2.5 years of loss of brain weight. Is there any expectation for that besides the Alzheimer's, or is that the only possible loss? So we asked about the brain weight and how it he asked about the brain weight and how it decreased over the 2.5 to 4 months, correct? And if that's only in Alzheimer's disease or other um, neurodegenerative diseases. Well, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease, which is the degeneration of neurons, loss of neurons. So, no, I wouldn't say it would be only in Alzheimer's disease. There's also Parkinson's disease. It's another form of neurodegenerative disease that also deals with the loss of neurons. 
which could also decrease in brain weight and other mice models that are representative of Parkinson's disease. Very good. We still have time. Back to Hey guys. Hi. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on how neurogenesis increases with age? And do you have any like hypotheses as to the mechanism behind that? He asked um, if, sorry. Okay. He asked if there is um, any mechanism that we are aware of how neurogenesis decreases with age and if there is any hypotheses on that. Is that what you, the end of that? Yeah. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so as neurogenesis progresses, this leads to the death of neurons and as a person, gets older, um, the synapses, the synaptal connections between the neurons become weaker, um, but not like super significant every year, but as time goes by, this does weaken, and in neurodegenerative diseases, it even weakens even more, so that's what we wanted to explore in this experiment. Okay, we have one more. Yeah, I have a singer. If not, let's thank Tim Green once again for the job well done. What we're going to do now, we're going to just stay put, stay right at the seat, and we're going to have the discussion and the mentor, talking with the team, to the secret hidden room in the bowels of the building, we're going to spend an hour going through their thesis and have lots of fun. Uh, Thank you. 